And now we're going to take a look at scheduling in Windows as well as Unix. Um, and we mean like the actual commercial operating systems, um, how they schedule um, processes and threads. Uh, and this is a lead up to our next topic, which considers a, a much more in-depth view of how a modern Linux system does scheduling. Um, but we'll start with talking about Unix uh, and the traditional Unix scheduling. Um, and this is um, just an examination to see what's sort of interesting or novel about them or how they resemble things we've talked about so far. So the traditional Unix scheduling is the first one to talk about, and it's like really ancient. Um, we're talking like Unix System 5R3 and BSD 4.3, and it was replaced um, a little bit later on. Um, but again, we are really talking about ancient history here. So um, what we are discussing is a multi-level feedback system. Uh, so there are different queues for things of different priority, um, and each of those queues is going to be um, scheduled using round robin, so within it. Okay, so good news. We know about each of those things, so there isn't really a lot of need to discuss those in detail. Um, so moving on. It does have time slicing, as, as is not surprising considering we talked about round robin. Um, and the original time slice is a very long one full second. Uh, again, this sort of highlights how long ago we're talking about. You know, computers uh, used to uh, be able to accomplish much less in a second than they can accomplish now. Um, so one second felt much more like a, a useful chunk of time. Um, and if a process doesn't block or complete within one second, then the timer interrupts uh, triggers preemption uh, and uh, the scheduler will run and choose the next thing. Uh, and priority for a process is based on the type of the process as well as its execution history. So processor utilization for process J is calculated over an interval I as the formula shown, CPU uh, J of I is the CPU J of I minus one divided by two. Uh, and the priority for the process is calculated by the, perform uh, by the formula um, B sub J, the pri base priority of the process, plus the CPU value J divided by two, plus the N sub J, N is the nice value. Okay, uh, what's up with, with each of those? So processor utilization has a you know, decay factor, um, similar to what we discussed earlier, where it uh, is divided by half for estimating the, the next CPU usage. So it does decay uh, with, with this factor over time. Fair enough. Um, and then um, the priority is calculated using the base priority, uh, the CPU factor, uh, and then the nice value. And the nice value is the Unix way of allowing the user to voluntarily ask a process to be nice to other users. And you can question who actually uses this, um, right? Who, who wants to be nice? Um, the answer is actually system administrators, right? System administrators, if they notice that a particular process is using a lot of CPU time or is otherwise kind of misbehaving uh, or uh, not uh, taking uh, other processes into account, let's call it that, can be made nice by a system administrator to make it nicer than it otherwise would be. Uh, and so this is part of the reason why um, uh, a nice process has a positive nice value uh, and a not nice process has a negative nice value. Uh, and that corresponds to something we discussed earlier uh, around the idea that a process um, that has a higher number for priority in Unix is actually you know, a lower priority to get to the CPU. So yeah, the CPU and N components uh, of the equation uh, are restricted a little bit to prevent a process from migrating outside of its assigned category. Um, and category is based on, um, well, what the operating system thinks about it. Um, and the next slide has some information about priorities um, and what the categories are. To put it in simple terms, um, how does this work in, um, in Unix? Well, the operating system puts its own needs first and tries to make the best use of resources that it can. Okay, uh, this flies a little bit in the face of something we've talked about earlier, which is you know, the goal of the operating system is to help processes run. But, well, listen, this is the design decision of Unix. So there are five categories here. 
Number one is the swapper. So when the operating system wants to move something to or from disk, that has priority. Other things need to get out of the way. Um, and then block I.O. device control, so reading to or, uh, to or from disk, or writing to or from disk, same thing, um, is you know, given priority. File manipulation comes in third. Character and I.O. device control, so keyboard or something that gets you know, a small amount of data at once. Uh, and then finally at the bottom is user processes. Oh boy. Um, yeah, unfortunately user processes get piled at the bottom of the list. Um, the use of the hierarchy should provide for ideally efficient use of I.O. devices um, and it does tend to penalize CPU bound processes at the expense of I.O. bound processes, which is kind of what you want, right? Um, when, when we're living in a world where I.O. is expensive, Keeping the I.O. devices busy is good, so CPU bound processes having to wait a little bit is okay um, because it is encouraging, if you will, uh, that you know, when a CPU bound process is running, that's fine, an I.O. bound process gets a turn, uh, and when it does get a turn, it issues an I.O. request, and before you know it, you know, it's blocked again. So that kind of thing is valuable because it's making best use of the resources. The strategy is reasonably effective for a general purpose time sharing operating system, right? And time sharing in this regard means like it's used by multiple users running multiple processes at the same time. It meets the design goals of Unix as it was originally envisioned. That's not to say this is you know, optimal for everything. Uh, in fact, I think we could probably argue it's not optimal even for its original goals anymore, but um, you know, for the time it was considered appropriate. Um, yeah, we'll also talk about Windows. Uh, and Windows uses a scheduling algorithm to schedule threads that is preemptive uh, and it always ensures that the highest priority thread runs, recognizing that priorities change during execution so that no one is left to starve. The official name for the selection routine in Windows is the dispatcher. Um, we talked about it as the short-term scheduler, but you could also call it the dispatcher, same thing. Um, and well, a thread runs until it's preempted, until it gets blocked, until it terminates, or its time slice expires. Um, if a higher priority thread does get unblocked, it will preempt a lower priority thread from the point of view of Windows. Uh, and Windows has 32 different priority levels, the regular 1 to 15, uh, and real-time classes 16 to 31. Um, but I, I remind you that um, calling something a real-time priority doesn't make it you know, guaranteed to meet deadlines in Windows. Uh, I don't actually know why they use this, uh, this verbiage, but they do. Um, there is a memory management task that runs at priority zero, which is going to be you know, sort of the lowest priority if it has something to do. Um, and the dispatcher maintains a queue for each of the priority levels and it goes through them from highest to lowest until it finds something to do. Yes, in Windows, higher numbers means higher priorities. Um, as I said, this kind of thing can give you a headache um, because if there are two ways to do something, we will definitely do it uh, in both ways. If there's nothing else ready, the system idle process runs, as, as we should expect. So if we look in Task Manager, you can set the following priorities. You can set something to be real-time, high, above normal, normal, below normal, and low. That's a lot of names for things, but you know, sure, there are six categories. A process is normally in the normal class. And within that class, there are relative priorities and outside of the real-time class, things can change. Uh, and so this table kind of represents the uh, actual priorities for any given task. So the things that we get some influence over are the ones at the top. Like we can choose what column we're in um, and by default something starts as normal uh, and the operating system's input is on the row is it idle lowest below normal normal above normal highest or time critical now as you can see um, it is entirely possible that you know I've said uh, uh, I insist that my um, that my process is you know highest priority um, and you know putting it in the real-time category does mean it goes before other things um, but putting it in the high category doesn't guarantee necessarily that it's going to run you know, before things that are in the um, above normal, normal, below normal, 
categories because, well, Windows can and does override your choices because I've said, oh, this is high priority um, and Windows will say, yeah, but I think it's idle. So it actually gets a priority of one. And you're like, well, that happened. So setting it to real time does have an effect. It does to some extent guarantee that it's gonna happen um, above and before other things. But as I said, you don't always want this, right? Um, as, as a user, it's definitely possible to choose wrong. And if we do, we're just making our own life more miserable uh, and we're not actually getting, um, we're not actually getting better performance. We're not actually getting like a better outcome. Uh, we're just slowing down you know, the performance of other processes or the system generally. Nevertheless, um, once this has been sort of calculated, it's got a, a, a priority that's assigned. Um, and if a process is running and it reaches the end of a time slice, the thread is interrupted. Um, and unless it's in the real time category, by reaching the end of the time slice, its priority is lowered uh, to a minimum of the base priority of each class, which we just saw was one. Um, when a process that was blocked on something, so waiting uh, on something or an I.O., its process priority is temporarily boosted, in which, unless it's real time or maxed out already, in which case it can't go up anymore. Um, and the amount of the boost depends on the nature of the event uh, that has occurred. Uh, if it is um, keyboard input, that suggests it's probably a user interactive program, so it gets a bit more of a boost um, than it would if it was like waiting for disk I.O. Um, but it gets some boost, right? When it's ready, all right, it's your turn. Let's get going. Um, you can make use of that uh, result that you were, or that thing that you were waiting for as quickly as possible. Um, interestingly, also, Windows gives priority to whichever process is running in the selected foreground window. So if you have like a, a, an editor that's open and it's the one that you have you know, currently on top in the UI, um, that's interesting. Right. Um, I don't mean this in the sense of like foreground versus background processes where I mean like user interactive versus not. Um, I mean, in the sense of like which of the user interactive processes you currently have focused in the UI um, and whichever one you currently have focused not only gets a priority boost, but it gets longer time slices. You can turn that off if you want, uh, or at least you used to be able to in earlier versions of Windows, um, but it really highlights kind of a different heritage of you know, Unix as an operating system versus Windows, uh, or as Unix was intended as like a time-sharing multi-user operating system. The view from uh, Windows was originally, you know, this is a single-user desktop operating system. So what I'm looking at right now, what I'm working on in the screen, you know, I have the PDF viewer open right now, or I have the code editor open right now, that should be the focus. So yeah, this really highlights the different heritages, if you will, of Windows and Unix. Okay, so that's really it for our introduction to Unix uh, scheduling and a little bit about Windows. Um, we'll see in the next topic, Linux does not use the traditional Unix scheduler anymore because it's rather outdated. Um, but what Linux does is actually quite interesting. So we'll spend some time to talk about that.